Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We're continuing with our exploration of the special theory of relativity and our reflections on the Quran. And I'm hoping by now that you feel that this approach is perhaps different than other approaches you have seen regarding religion and science. And I'm hoping that it will be complementary to whatever else you study or you hear, because I thus far have not seen this approach taken before, and I believe that there is a need for it to complement other approaches that are out there. So we saw that with the Lorentz transformations, we can express coordinates of an event in a moving frame of reference versus a stationary frame of reference. And the addition of velocities ends up working differently. Passage of time is different. Separation of objects is different. And we can continue to also look at what happens to the other laws of physics, if you will. And what I'd like to do now is take a look at the notion of momentum and what happens to it with relativity. In Newtonian physics, momentum, which is typically expressed with the letter P, the momentum of an object is its mass times its velocity. So if an object is moving with a certain velocity and has a certain mass, when we multiply those together, we get its momentum. And that momentum is a very fundamental concept in physics. And so we see, for example, that even though a bullet has a very small mass, because it moves so fast, it may have a large momentum. Something else may have a large mass, but if it is not moving at all, say an elephant who's standing still, that elephant has a very large mass, but his momentum is zero. So he's not able to impart any energy to anything just standing still. When we look at what the equations of relativity tell us about momentum, we see that it is sort of similar to the world of Newton, that it is m0, and we'll come back to what this zero means. It's mv, the mass times the velocity, but again divided by this gamma-like factor, 1 minus v squared over c squared. What are the implications of this? Well, they're actually very significant. With the world of Newton, as the speed of something increases, its momentum simply increases. And we said that in Newton's world, and up until Einstein, there was no limit to velocity. If you had enough energy, you could go at any velocity you wanted. But let's look at what happens when v approaches c. That means this fraction, v squared over c squared, gets very close to 1. We're dividing by 1 minus almost 1. That's a very, very small number that we're dividing by, so the momentum rises drastically. In fact, if v were to equal c, it would be 1 minus 1. We would be dividing by 0, which you know gives us infinity. So momentum in relativity goes like this, and as we approach 1 times the speed of light, the momentum actually becomes infinite. That means it would take an infinite amount of energy to move something at the speed of light. Another way to think about it is that this factor here modifies the mass so that it is m over this factor times v that things actually get heavier as they move more quickly. And as bizarre as that sounds, this has been verified over and over again with subatomic particles. And that indeed, it is Einstein's understanding of momentum, not Newton's, which is correct, but we just don't see it because in the world we live in, the ratio of v to c is so small that this is almost zero, and so it looks like momentum is mv. Now, what is the significance of this? Well, the significance of this is when we come to calculate energy and work. Bear with me here because I, I, I think, inshallah, you will find this very rewarding. 
In the world of Newton, P momentum is mv. Force is ma, the acceleration, mass times the acceleration. Well, acceleration is nothing but the change in velocity over time, and so force is really, if the mass stays the same, it is the change in momentum over the change in time. That is what force is. And force is what we use to do work. And work is the same as energy. So, in Newtonian physics, if we want to calculate the work done on an object, then we go from this equation where force is the change in the rate of momentum with time. We would substitute that in here for force. You don't have to worry about this, but I just wanted to show it to you. And we would integrate the force over the path along which the work is being done. And if we do this integration, and again, I won't torture you with the math, but we get then that the kinetic energy of an object falls out to be the famous equation that you may remember from high school physics, one half mv squared. If we were to substitute the change in momentum with time for force and do the integration, this is the result according to Newton. Well, we said according to Einstein, the laws of physics have to be exactly the same. That means work has to still be defined as force integrated over path, because that's a law of physics. And force is still defined as the rate of change of momentum, because that's a law of physics. But we said that the momentum, according to special relativity, is given by this equation, not by mv. And when we substitute this expression of momentum and do the change in the rate of momentum as force, simply substitute instead of mv this expression for p into this equation, we get this expression for kinetic energy. mc squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared minus mc squared. Let us look at the implications of this, because this is where the world's most famous equation comes from. E equals mc squared, and here's a photo of Einstein actually writing it on the board from historical archives. This is how Einstein derived this equation. That kinetic energy is really some energy here, mc squared, over 1 square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared minus another energy which has nothing to do with the velocity. This bit of the energy is dependent on the velocity of the object. v is the velocity of the object. But subtracted from it is this term mc squared which doesn't depend on the velocity of the object and this is what is known as the rest energy. So Einstein derived that when an object moves, when work is done to move an object, its kinetic energy is its total energy minus its rest energy. Well, what then is this rest energy? This rest energy is mc squared, and this is how we get the equation E equals mc squared. I know we didn't do the integration together, but at least now we have a feel for where this equation that everybody knows, that everybody wears on t-shirts, where did it come from? And you have now seen where this equation came from. This was another unbelievable revolution. Because what Einstein said is that every object inherent in it has its own energy, called its rest energy, that is its mass times the speed of light squared. So what was he saying? He was saying that mass and energy are equivalent. We no longer think of mass and energy. We think of mass energy, just like space-time. And that mass can be converted to energy and vice versa. This was absolutely unbelievable. Nobody had conceived of this. People thought there was matter, i.e. mass, and there was energy. And they were separate. Einstein said, no, they're not separate. They're really different forms of the same thing. 
and they are related by his equation E equals mc squared. What implication does this have for us as Muslims? The equivalence of energy and matter gets right at the heart of a critical objection that secularists up until Einstein had made against religionists. When we have a verse, for example, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says as in Surah Al-Baqarah, بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَإِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُمْ فَيَكُونَ To him is due the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. When he decrees a matter, he saith to it be and it is. And this is called the divine be. And secularists or materialists, and I don't mean materialists like people who love money and are greedy, I mean people who believe that there is no spirit world, that all there is is matter and energy and chance and laws of physics, they would point the finger at religionists and say, how can you have creation ex nihilo, creation of matter out of nothing, because we know that there is a law of physics called the law of conservation of matter. You can't create matter out of nothing. And that was the view for thousands of years. And then Einstein comes along and says matter and energy are equivalent. And in fact, you can create matter where there was no matter before. There is no such thing as the law of conservation of matter or the law of conservation of energy. There's the law of conservation of mass energy. And if you have energy, sufficient energy, you can create matter. And this, to me, is a reflection of the divine be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the infinite source of energy all he needs to say is be and a small touch of that energy can instantaneously become matter and so we see now how special relativity takes away the objection of creation ex nihilo and this is something which has been verified now in the lab over and over and over again through something called pair production. And this is the creation of elementary particles or an elementary particle and its antiparticles from energy, like the energy of a photon. And if the, that energy is high enough, 1.022 uh, million electron volts, then the energy can create an electron and a positron where no matter was before. And so, we see now where E equals mc squared came from. We see that this was an entirely revolutionary idea about how the universe worked, that the world is not divided into matter and energy, that they are different forms of the same thing, and that, indeed, this understanding now brings an appreciation for God's divine be, where all of a sudden a creation of matter can occur where none existed before. And of course, there have been much more sinister verifications of this equation, because it is this equation and this understanding which led to the development of atomic weapons, because the mass differences in fission of nuclei or fusion of nuclei, it is the conversion of that mass into energy which leads to the horribly destructive capacity of nuclear weapons and also holds a promise for the future in terms of clean energy production with nuclear reactors. All of it is because of the equivalence of mass and energy. And so, as world citizens, we would want to know about this even without any reflections on the Qur'an. But I hope, inshallah, that now we see things through a different window. And of course, the most significant creation ex nihilo was the Big Bang. And we touched upon before in episode 9, the beginning or the creation, how that idea that there was a Big Bang that there was a moment of creation of the universe, indeed was also very revolutionary and overturned thousands of years of scientific dogma. 
and it was Einstein's general relativity plus special relativity plus the work of Edwin Hubble that put all of that together and allowed people to see that what religionists had been saying all along, that this universe had a beginning in time, a moment of creation, is indeed true. Before, we used to accept it on faith. Now we accept it on faith and on science. Although there are still some who are missing the faith, but inshallah that will come as we explore with people who do not believe some of these ideas. I am hoping that some will be moved to uh, the notion of faith because, of course, what was left to us, okay, where would... How could this energy of the explosion produce all of the matter that then becomes all of the atoms that become our universe? Well, now we understand it is because of the equivalence of matter and energy. This ends our, our series of lectures on relativity. And from here, inshallah, we will move to some other issues, including cosmology, and maybe take a couple of fun detours along the way. But again, I am sincerely hoping that this was not too much and that you found in it something illuminating both about science and about the Qur'an. And thank you very much for your attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.